Well, good evening. This is a real treat to present to a joint meeting of um, a group which I'm a member of, MBGS, and enjoy very much, um, and an organization I soon to hope to be part of. I, I told the breakout group that my application is ready to be uh, notarized, and I think I've got my I found three crazy friends willing to sponsor me and so forth. Um, so I hope to be a member of AIPG um, soon. Um, and I hope other guests will, um, guests that are joining tonight might consider both organizations and uh, benefiting from just being connected with fellow geoscientists. A presentation on coal mining is great for me because we technically regulate it, um, but haven't had a regulated mine since 1952. Um, and what was really cool about this was just the preparation for this talk allowed me to take a, a deeper dive into the topic that, uh, than I ever have previously. I can't convey everything that I learned in this um, preparing for this or little rabbit trails that I took, but um, I will say I just had a lot of fun in, in preparing it. So my groundbreaking presentation tonight on Michigan coal is only made possible by about 186 years of prior research. And I'm truly standing on the shoulders of giants today and want to acknowledge some of the contributors. Um, as OGMD director and state geologist, I, I feel like my research here into this, this talk's given me a deep, deeper appreciation for um, some of my professional great, great, great grandfathers, so to speak. The uh, earliest in Investigations of coal bearing strata uh, were in the vicinity of Jacksonburg, now known as Jackson. Houghton, Hubbard, and Douglas completed more detailed studies between 1861 and 1882. Um, you can see a real live picture here of Doug um, sitting by the river uh, in the Grand River at Jacksonburg, thinking to himself, the sandstone is seen to embrace the, a bed of bituminous shale intermixed with thin layers of coal. Pretty amazing that we have that picture. Um, these initial investigations were further, um, they were taken forward by other researchers, Alexander Winchell, Rominger, and Lawton between 1861, 1882. You see uh, uh, Winchell's maps over my shoulder, and uh, that's a gift from my mom this year, I think an 1877 map, it's pretty cool. Um, but anyway, it was during this period that Winchell subdivided the coal measures of Michigan into three main stratigraphic units, which became the basis for the Pennsylvanian uh, system, the present system in, in Michigan nomenclature. Incidentally, Charles Lawton will be quoted a fair amount in this talk, a couple, a couple times anyway, but he was an inspector of mines for the Michigan Commission on Mines in the late 1800s. Corresponding with the near peak of Michigan coal production, Alfred Lane's 1902 comprehensive report, uh, Coal of Michigan, its mode of occurrence and quality, uh, summarized the work of several people's investigations in the preceding decades. And more recently, Cohey's uh, coal report, a USGS, I think USGS circular 77 in 1950 is a good landmark resource for benching marking the status of coal mining right before it ended. And I refer to this a lot in this presentation. Others have all further documented the Pennsylvanian sequence stratigraphy and uh, Pennsylvanian C, uh, system. I'll be noting some of the more recent work by Dr. West John on the Parma sandstone in the Jackson area as I, I go through this. But uh, I, I've got quite a bit of quite a bibliography. I'm pretty amazed how much time you can spend in such a, a really a small section of strata. This slide gives you an idea of the aerial extent of coal bearing strata in the Pennsylvanian uh, coal deposits. They're typically found within the center of Michigan basin and can generally uh, be found less than 50 foot deep in the southeastern half of the occurrence and greater than 500 feet to the northwest. Of course, this wasn't the orientation or, or latitude of in time of emplacement. Uh, indeed, most of the commercial coal mining did occur on sort of a strike line between um, sort of the Saginaw Bay and Jackson area where the coal uh, is closest to the surface. To level set with some basic Michigan, G Michigan Basin geological history, the basin is bounded by several arches uh, north northeast by the Canadian Shield, southwest northwest by the Wisconsin Arch, southwest by the Kankakee Arch, and southeast by the Finley Arch, and, and finally to the east by the Ontario Arch. 
Throughout the history of the basin, most of the sedimentary strata bear witness to shallow um, marine transgressive regressive conditions with rare and sporadic uh, periods of tectonic uplift, which give us uh, erosional surfaces, periods of non-deposition non and also deposition of fluvial or subaerial sedimentary rock. One of the uh, resulting erosional features is the unconformity between the slightly folded marine bayport limestone in the Mississippian age of Mississippian age and the deltaic and fluvatile uh, coal bearing rocks of Pennsylvanian age. In early Pennsylvanian time, the area was a shallow basin and a series of rivers flowed into it from east to west. Again, not that orientation, but you can think of the sedimentary conditions of the time ranging from marshy fluvatile deltaic on the east to shallow brackish marine on the north, northwest west, and west. In time, all these Pennsylvanian rocks are partially covered by red beds of late Jurassic age. So there is the matter of the missing Permian and Mesozoic strata. Was it ever there? Where did it go? That can be the topic of somebody else's presentation on another day. Take a trip back in time with me, if you would, just kind of um, close your eyes and you, you, as time transports us back 300 million plus years, um, you'd be standing in this dynamic deltaic setting with large swamps. And I think Dr. Westjohn would say um, the swamps were probably within oxbows and other sloughs, um, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit more laterally extensive in shallow situations, but um, really not all that laterally continuous. And you'll see lush tropical swamp environment with giant fern species and canopies of that Euro-American um, plate um, canopies reaching nearly 100 feet. You may have to duck because there's these crazy uh, one foot long giant um, dragonflies uh, zooming about and cockroaches the size of your hands scurrying about. The, the Massasauga rattlesnake was not yet uh, the state snake, although fish and reptiles were making appearances. This highly productive uh, swamp biomass ultimately becomes the source material for thin discontinuous coal seams we see in the geologic record today. Chris just took a group from Eastern out to the, the um, ledges, so they probably got a lot deeper dive into the facies than I'm going to give you, but uh, the, the Pennsylvanian system can be thought of in three main systems, the Parma Sandstone, the Saginaw Formation, and the Grand River Formation. There are many coal layers in the Pennsylvanian, as many as 14 different layers. But the important stratigraphy to keep in mind is the coal is in the Saginaw Formation. And it has three main beds, the Saginaw Coal, the Lower Vern, and the Upper Vern. Uh, the Saginaw bed is the most laterally extensive. It, it, it was the most economically important. Um, beds dip towards the center of the basin, generally between 11 and 20 feet per mile. And uh, the Vern beds are, are above the Saginaw bed of coal. And at times they were mined as just one unit. The Parma sandstone is a non-bearing unit below and the sandstones of the Saginaw and Grand River formations are above. Um, because this was a very dynamic fluvial deltaic environment, local stratigraphy can get pretty wild as Dave Westjohn noted in a previous talk to the Basin Society. Uh, last year with basal, basal Pennsylvania and sandstones at times occupying scour valleys deep into the Mississippian strata. This whole puzzle can be made more complicated due to minor transgressive and regressive sequences within the Pennsylvanian. Uh, they gave us some shale, shaley limestone, fire clay, argillaceous limestone um, in, the, in this mostly deltaic puzzle. So the coal deposits of uh, just a little bit on coal seams and quality in Michigan. The coal deposits of Saginaw Formation are generally three feet thick or less, and Cohe provided the following characteristics of Michigan coal. Uh, there are few beds. They average they, they really average less than three feet in thickness and generally range between two and a, two and two and a half to three feet. You get a sense of that in the above left picture that gives you a good idea of what coal mining was like in this period underground. Coal beds could vary from 30 to 50 feet in elevation over only a quarter mile. They can thicken, thin, pinch out entirely within a few hundred feet or split into two or more distinct beds. Displacement of coal by faulting is common, was common. 
Uh, most areas of proven coal reserves were less than 150 feet. Some contain or some areas of proven coal reserves are less than a, 150 acres. Uh, some contain contained uh, 250 acres, and only very few contain more than a thousand acres of proven reserves. So pretty discontinuous. The coal deposits were high volatility rank B and C bituminous coal and were suitable for domestic and industrial fuels, but not suitable for manufacturing coke. Uh, as received, the heat values ranged from 10,500 to 12,300 BTUs per pound. Moist, high moisture uh, ranging between eight and 15 percent. Sulfur contents ranging from one to three percent with the sulfur content increasing towards the southern part of the fields. In general, Michigan coals uh, vary greatly in their characteristics um, with the coals in the southern portion of the basin, namely Jackson County having higher sulfur and ash and lower car carbon content, while the coals up in Bay and Saginaw counties uh, were generally in better quality and um, at times thicker and more continuous. The above right photo um, shows some of the sulfur crystals within the seam exposed at Fitzgerald Park um, in Grand Ledge. So this, I was joined this last Sunday by Mark Snow of OGMD and Deputy Director Aaron Keatley and even got a surprise um, guest, Director Clark, Liesl Clark joined us on a field trip to the ledges of Grand River, uh, of Grand Ledge. Our mission was to enjoy and observe the uh, spectacular sandstone ledges, but also to find the coal, the coal. that was our mission, obviously. I kind of wanted to go take a look at the coal. I hadn't been to the ledges since said strat, I think a zillion years ago, um, 28 or 29 years, but who's counting? Um, so it was nice. The Pennsylvania coal of Saginaw Formation is just wonderfully displayed just about 50 feet um, west of the Nature Center by the fish ladder and the wastewater treatment plant. Um, as mentioned in a previous slide, you could actually see sulfur crystallization within the two foot coal seam. And there was some pretty cool um, chert nodules there that would be right at about uh, Liesl's knee level in the sand below. So I, I know you can't read everything on here, but the graph comes from Cohe's 1950 report, gives you an idea of the annual coal production from roughly 1860 to uh, 1950 when the report was authored with a total of about 500 million tons of coal mine. And some believe that it may be as high as 100 million tons were mined, but um, you know, because some of the mines were private, records were maybe a bit sketchy. Um, the number that's presented was 50 million tons of historic um, coal mine. You can think of how the industry ev um, evolved with essentially visible coal seams near Jackson, Grand Ledge, and Corona being mined as slope mines. Someone's walking along and they find a coal seam. They think, hey, that's coal and I'm going to be rich. Uh, coal was pretty important in the, um, the mid to late 1800s. Um, so they started mining down slope and they had their own slope mine. About this time, um, the coal was beginning to draw the attention of miners from England and Jackson got their first mining engineer, Mr. James Jenkins from Gloucester. Um, who went on to develop um, many mines around Michigan. You can see his gravestone um, here down in the area. But he was an exceptional singer, would often sing to the miners underground, but he eventually, um, kind of his undoing, I think he was singing to the miners one day and then um, was walking back through the workings and stepped into a, a, a shaft and did fall to his death. Um, as more boreholes were drilled um, near Saginaw, shaft mines became more prevalent as there was um, some more continuous coals, slightly thicker beds in that region. And then I'll also say that um, it was also common to drive inclines, um, you know, to do an add it and drive an incline down to uh, some of the deeper mines where they would actually stable horses and things underground. My talk is gonna focus heavily on Jackson area because that's where I live and, and I enjoy the history there. Liesl said, don't forget to mention Coal Miners Corner up by where she grew up. I have no idea exactly where that is. I didn't have time to look it up, but she was excited about it. And, um, but the point is there's no doubt that a person can dive as deep as they want 
um, within any of these coal mining areas and probably find a lot of fascinating history. And I know you can't read that, that map that's up there, but it's, it's worth knowing. Um, this is the work of George Econ, a retired Jackson uh, College, community college, just called Jackson College, geology professor. Um, and it's kind of been his late life work here and um, it shows somewhere around 70 mines just in the Jackson area with my favorite being the prison number one. So I really, I originally wanted to give you a lot of history. I took a lot of rabbit trails and we just can't do it in an hour. But um, so this is why the prison number one is my favorite. The old Jackson State Prison, which is still standing um, with stone walls used to be a pretty rough place, but prisoners um, did a lot of industry there. The cells were pretty uh, terrible and they had a bucket and you can use your imagination why you would only have a bucket in your cell, but um, not, not a great place to be. Um, but there was a lot of, when you, when you look at some of the old plats kind of shown here, there, there's like metal shops, wood shops. There's just a lot of industry. There was, there was, there was coal and uh, you guessed it. There was coal mines and prisoners were coal miners. So one of the main motivations for the prison was to make a profit. The prisoners were paid just under 34 cents a day. The going wage for that, that time was $1.50 a day. But here's the deal. Uh, prisoners were required to give about 28 cents of that pay back to the state. So prisoners were working for just basically about five cents a day, um, doing pretty, pretty strong manual labor. Um, but the leadership at the prison saw that as part of their punishment and considered it a good way to rehabilitate them. The, another reason why I kind of like this story is just um, so if you're going to use prisoners for, uh, for miners, you ought to know your geology and which way they're, they're mining because these miners followed a, a coal lead um, upward and, and right up to the surface and out of the ground where they escaped. And they were eventually captured, but I just thought that was super super cool story. And I've explained that the coal seams are thin and the geology above them can be pretty chaotic. And at times there's just really um, not a, much, a lot of rock above their head um, uh, and standing between them and some overburden. Uh, so collapse and subsidence, subsidence was a real common occurrence for these miners who must have just apparently had more guts than brains. But at least two men had met their death in the Jackson area and multiple other ones were injured at various times. But I like this account from one miner, Mr. Fred, um, or Mr. Friend. Um, he recalled in a December 12, 1952 Citizen Patriot article, he saw the mine posts moving, ran down and warned his father, who had already had a close call. At another time, his father and others saw slate dropping, a sign of possible cave-in. They sent the boy, Mr. Friend, out to watch. When he saw a large number of rats leaving the mine, squealing and tumbling in their haste to get across the railroad tracks, he warned his father, who said that's a sure sign of danger. His father brought out the coal car, however, and uh, before he quit working. A little bit on methods and history. In 1881, Charles Lawton inspected the mine, um, the slope mine which he identified as the largest coal mine in Michigan at the time of his inspection. His report provides a relatively detailed description of the slope mine. Um, specific economic and engineering details described by Lawton are as follows. The coal was not flat, but was undulating, rising and falling by as much as 15 feet. Coal seam height averaged between two and a half and three feet. Mining panels were about three feet in height. Main galleries were constructed to a six foot height. Main haulage ways galleries were supported by six inch diameter timber. Water entered the mine freely and was dewatered using number 10 Knowles pumps and discharged into the Grand River. Little blasting was required to remove coal. Instead, they would excavate towards the bottom, wedge the top and drop it, which is similar to a lot of the coal mines, underground coal mines in West Virginia. The uh, coal was hauled to the decline in mine carts along a track pulled by mules, which were stabled underground. Uh, mining was conducted on a contract basis uh, with a payment of 90 cents per ton. Productivity at the mine was about uh, 400 tons per day and it employed about 25 contra 125 contract miners. 
I thought this was really interesting because uh, in, in in one of the committees I'm on, we're talking a lot about full value mining, but at that time, um, iron pyrite was physically separated from the coal and used to manufacture a crude sulfuric acid. The mine produced about three tons of pyrite that produced about 100 tons of acid per month, which was sold to the Michigan Carbon Works in Detroit, Michigan. It appears that the slope mine closed in the 1890s and possibly during the 1893 financial crash. All of the mines in Jackson area and basically all the mines are below the groundwater table and as such would have required a lot of drainage. You can imagine that the rolling nature of the coal beds of the Saginaw Formation and its deltaic environment made this drainage all the more difficult to ditch and deal with that infiltrating groundwater. It's been speculated that the curved nature of mining rooms that you see in some of the workings maps was an attempt um, to mine the coal at a constant elevation to help um, with those ditching efforts and to keep the water away from the working faces. Um, this was just an interesting statement on that inspect mine inspectors in all the Jackson mines water runs freely and to get rid of it was a matter of some expense and trouble. A good deal of ditching is necessitated to run the water to the sumps and there were three number 10 Knowles pumps kept operating in the slope mine to pump it to the surface. This is a pretty interesting um, statement. Um, I'll just go ahead and read it. And Cohe's um, sort of summary of that USGS circular, he noted, although the reserve, although reserves remain, future coal mining appears unfavorable as of 19, January 1950. Necessary shafts, deeper depths, a blanket of glacial drift, the prevalence of groundwater at depth, increased cross of timber and the increased competition from oil and natural gas supported that statement. Um, and then this was really interesting too. In spite of the increasing use of oil and natural gas in Michigan, the demand for coal for natural or for domestic use in steam raising is large enough to support local mining industry. And it is possible that slight changes in the fuel economy of the state may result in increased local mining or that Exploration may, exploration may reveal new deposits of coal that can be worked more readily than those now known. I thought this was a really interesting statement in time for an industry that was facing the end of its economic life in the state. With 100 million tons of remaining mineable reserve, the, the number was actually, you know, the different um, categories uh, were closer to two, 250, but um, what was actually viewed as recoverable was 100 million tons. And the state was importing at that time about 25 million tons and using domestically about 8 million tons annually. So um, think of that as sort of a, a land uh, landmark, if you will, in, in 1950. And, and what he was kind of pontificating um, was the history or what was the future. And about two years later, the Jackson Sit Pat newspaper ran an interesting article on Sunday, April 6, 1952. Uh, and that was titled State Coal Mining Born Near Jackson Dies at St. Charles as the last commercial coal mine closed in Michigan at Swan Creek, uh, the Swan Creek coal mine. The miners of the Bliss Coal Field, their kind of coal mine company at Swan Creek Mine are shown in the background of this slide. Again, I apologize for um, if some of these maps seem small to you, but um, figure 10 from the Golders final report on the I-94 void investigation shows a review of the slope mine indicated that there was significant faulting, which affected the mining operations. This figure indicates that most mining ended due to faulting, not necessarily due to the coal, coal seam pinching out. Um, these faults were found on electrical resistivity imaging profiles and correlate well with the barrier pillar that extended between the slope mine and the, the porter mine. Um, so sort of the extents of the mining. There are, however, other areas that, where the mining did end due to roof collapses or unstable ground. Figure 11 from that Golder report illustrates the cross section of faulting where the sandstone, which is referred to as sand on the slope mine and as sand rock on the porter mine maps um, appears to have cut the coal seam. The direction of faulting is unclear and not indicated by current geologic maps, 
Um, so again, while some mine drifts ended in Michigan due to coal's, quote, pinching out, um, the work done on the I-94 project really seems to show that structural geology and faulting was, was, was a common reason for the working phase ending uh, abruptly. So one more bit of geology and mining engineering for our petrophysical minded guests. The I-94 project took extensive look at mine workings and rocks within uh, with modern techniques uh, to understand the old workings and methods. One thing that stood out to me was that when looking at rock quality by modern rock methods, geotechnical was run on glacial drift overburden, um, as well as rock quality designation RQDs being recorded for each core retrieved. Sandstones had medium to high RQDs and the shales uh, mudstones had lower RQDs. All that to say, when you consider the compressive strengths of the rock, RQDs, rock mass ratings, and stand-up times at the site, um, the site is on average classified as, as pretty weak rocks. And the mine's extraction ratio was found to be 54 to 63%, which was pretty high for coal mines at that time um, uh, for room and pillar methods of that time. In 1881, the mine inspector Lawton had noticed, noted, the rooms come close together, the partitions are very narrow, but by free use, free use of timber, an apparent safety is preserved. These timbers are from three feet to six feet in length and about six inches in diameter. So it's not surprising that there are records of collapse and subsidence and uh, over time bridging and sinkholes, especially unsupported. Um, the stand-up time indicated by um, sort of the diagram in the background um, and that report shows that the stand-up times for these workings would have been as few as hours um, to a month. Um, so very short time that these would stand up unsupported under their own weight. Um, so unsupported workings in the Jackson area in particular were likely to have collapsed by now or or as indicated within literally months of when they were stopped used, stopped being used. Um, but because these mines were flighted, were flooded after closure, it does stand to reason that there, there was an air down there and these timbers are still supporting um, the main workings and, and haul areas. Okay, I wanna move into legacy issues of coal mining a little bit. Um, in April of 2020, we, we received an inquiry from a concerned resident in Jackson about a sinkhole that had opened up in her backyard on Andrews Street. Myself and Larry Bean and George Econ, a re that retired professor, um, all kind of engaged on the issue. I took measurements and photos and installed a snow fence around the sinkhole for the property owner. It was within the, the police do not cross line. The police pretty much like roped off her whole backyard. Um, but George had beat me. Um, George just really loves these coal mine issues in Jackson. And, and I know Larry does too, but um, George had beat me out there by, by a day. Um, and I referenced that personal data my, um, uh, database or GIS layer, if you will, uh, which he's now left to the county. And I have a copy of it's just very nice for um, if we get reports of sinkholes or, or these settling issues to uh, pretty quickly zero in on one, which one of those 70 mines it might be. Um, this, this particular issue could have been a collapse feature from a septic field or, or a stump or some other feature, but there's very strong likelihood is associated with a shaft or simple collapse of the mine workings with subsequent infiltration of um, groundwater washing material down into the mine workings. Um, I would put the the property very near the border of the former Porter mine and the Conaval mine. A property owner did fill in the hole and, and just observed it. That's sort of the best advice we had for her at the time um, because there is no magic um, fix for these things. And I reach, recently reached back out to her to see if the fix had worked or if there was further subsidence. She did indicate that um, it had held, um, but there was, it did seem to be some minor settling going on. Ultimately, the only relief for property owners like this may be funds available from the Office of Surface Mining and Enforcement, Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement, uh, which maintains a legacy fund which coal mining companies continue to pay into. 
currently they pay about 28 cents for surface mines and about 12 cents for underground mines for every ton produced. I believe Michigan has had to utilize these funds to address legacy issues a couple times um, before my time. But often holes like these, um, they do open up around Jackson and they're just filled in with debris and soil and they hold. Um, and that's basically what they did to abandon these shafts in the first place. But this isn't how I would envision us requiring a company to stabilize them now under part 635, uh, which is our coal mining statute. That certainly was the, the common practice for these when they were abandoned over a hundred years ago. So groundwater contamination, this is another example of legacy issues. In October, 2020, I was contacted by Eagles Clean Water, a public advocate on behalf of the city of Flint, who was concerned about the presence of historic coal mines and whether the agency checks for toxins and uh, could, be, could it be that some of these tunnels dug during under Flint during World War II and the Cold War could have been dumping grounds for unregulated hazardous waste. This is a really good question. Our team looked into that possibility. And by team, I mean John Esch. Um, the city of Flint and vicinity only had really one mine. It was the What Cheer 2 mine. Um, there is more mines off to the Northwest in the area, but really in the vicinity of Flint, it's just the What Cheer 2. That mine is about 233 feet. Um, and it did range in average, ranged in depth between 180 and 280 feet below surface. So again, um, they do dip and they do undulate. The records indicated that the mine had only two shafts, uh, primary access and an air shaft. They're circled in red there. Uh, we ultimately looked at the surrounding wells and uh, the limited records that were around there in the geology. Um, we did feel that, you know, the mine would, would, would have been flooded post closure. And um, the, the fact that, the, that there was only two uh, filled in abandoned shafts and no known contamination um, in, in, a, in a 70 year history for that time period, we thought the likelihood was low, but yet possible, um, but really unknowable without specific subsurface investigation, uh, targeting that those workings and, and testing the groundwater. Now I want to just switch to uh, the I-94 coal mine mitigation case study because this is an example of legacy issues impacting a, a pretty large infrastructure project, um, the I-94 corridor project, but especially in that area of the Cooper Road interchange. Before I came to work for Oil, Gas, and Minerals Division, I worked for MDOT, the university in North Region, working in permitting and compliance. And one of my last projects when I left was beginning the scoping of this I-94 project and specifically looking at the coal mine risk to the project. I pulled together some early resources, which included the accounts of the I-94 collapses in the late 1960s and early 70s um, due to a, a coal shaft, a coal mine shaft. And uh, we also engaged the expertise of Stan Vatan at Michigan Tech to help us out with that project. After I left MDOT, the project evolved and there are many subsequent phases of investigation with numerous contractors, including Golder and Associates. The principal investigations that occurred prior to the actual construction and mitigation of the project are summarized on this slide beyond the, um, the preliminary accounts that we had in the 70s that, that MDOT knew about it. Um, there was full literature searches, citizen patent in the 1800s. There was a project to see what the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation had, the abandoned mines, um, mine lands project review. There was a physical site investigation. There was non-intrusive investigation with electrical resistivity uh, imaging that I referenced in the previous slide. That interpretation noting coarser grain soils and sedimentary rock resolution wasn't sufficient enough to really pick out the um, two to three foot coal seam, but uh, did find the geology of the area disturbed by several fault lines, uh, likely forming the barrier pillar between the porter and the slope mines, and a large sandstone deposit extending deeper than um, the other areas of the site, i.e. kind of what um, Dave Westjohn had looked at. And then ultimately, uh, they did intrusive investigations, just many, many physical borings to map soil and rock properties, lithologies to confirm the existence of voids and their extents and to collect rock cores. One, one news account that mentioned the Emerson mine, which it really 
appears that it was referring to the slope mine right in this area. Um, kind of talks about some of this faulting and, and subsidence matter. And I thought it was worth noting in 1905, it related that in several instances, buildings standing on places which have thus settled, of course, settled with their foundations. They were carried down so gradually and gently that little notice was taken of it. And in no case has a building sunk independent of its contiguous area, more or less extensive. So that as a general thing, the appearance of the premises underwent little observable change. Um, whereas the, where the Emerson mine goes uh, some time ago, a small orchard sank a couple of feet, but its only relation to the adjacent territory is such that it would hardly be suspected that any of it had any event had befallen it. Over a year since the house of H. A Howell T. Howells, 18 Cooper Street sank a little and three, three months ago, a barn in that neighborhood belonging to John Tremling settled, but nothing was noted of it. Recently, just north of Emerson Mine, near David Price's dwelling, the earth was found to be sinking and it was not improbable that the dwelling will be involved as the coal of the thickness of two or three feet has been taken from beneath it. Allusion has been made to the sinking of a small brick house of Lewis Leinhold, a florist at 37 Cooper Street. But aside from two or three small fissures in the cellar walls, the building seems to be intact and in no danger of additional injury or collapse. As usual, however, the buildings in this district are a frame and there are, is little or no danger of their falling in case of the ground beneath them settles as already explained. Just, just interesting to look back through um, what the newspaper says about these things. Within a relatively small project area, an amazing amount of borings were completed, uh, logging both lithology from cuttings as well as taking of core samples. In these borings, the investigators were I, I able to identify mine areas, uh, mine working, uh, gob areas, collapse features, and scour areas. Some of the logs indicated that miners excavating the coal seam had very little rock overhead due to the irregularity of the erosional surfaces of the Saginaw Formation. Um, and I truly wonder if any of them knew at times um, that there was a, just literally a matter of one, one foot of uh, solid rock above them and then the unconsolidated, unconsolidated glacial drift. Um, but it, it sounds like from some of those news reports that I already gave you that they did know and they, they didn't care. I guess they just send the boy out to watch and see what happens. This is a random side note, um, not to let a good new excavation and exposure go to waste. Dr. West John and I ventured out, I think it was March of 2019, to look at the fresh new rock exposed in the northwest quadrant of that interstate interchange project. I think most of you are familiar with that sandstone outcrop that's always been present on the northeast quadrant, and you'll see it in the next slide, one of Larry Bean's slides. Um, but ultimately, MDOT did cover this new rock exposure in the northwest, but I think largely due to the pleadings of um, the geologists of our, uh, of our community here, they recognize the historic importance of that outcrop on the east side, they could have they could have really easily just um, sloped it back and covered it with soil like they did on the, the west side, but thankfully they didn't and it remains. So getting back to coal mine mitigation, when you look at the mitigation plan for MDOT's I-94 and Cooper Street interchange project, the plan was to use grout curtains and to stabilize, to stabilize the underground workings under the bridge and to utilize continuously reinforced concrete pavement design. Continuously reinforced concrete pavement design is um, designed to stand up even if there's a collapse that occurs underneath the pavement so it doesn't present an immediate threat to uh, the public safety of motorists. The grout curtains, um, initially in my mind I was trying to picture grout curtains, um, how that all worked when we started talking about grout curtain and mine because I didn't have experience with that, but grout curtains is a really complex plan but simple at the same time. Um, it's basically a tight matrix of boreholes in the treatment area. You can see approximate workings of the Porter mine shown with hatching below the southern bridge abutment to the left. The boreholes were drilled to identify log and log the lithology to identify the gob and mine workings. 
Um, and then it received um, one of three types of grout as a treatment. The diagram is difficult to read because of the scale, but if you look at the outer ring, there are black dots representing uh, primary bore holes that were to receive the thicker grout, um, which would be a low mobility grout or LMG, which could stand up under its own weight when it was pumped into the voids. This can be thought of creating um, a partial outer curtain, but there was also some of these LMG borings throughout the, the treatment area as well, sort of recreating um, pillars back within the mine. The, the open dots are the secondary low mobility grout treatments. Then the area is further treated um, with boreholes that receive medium mobility grout or MMG, which was uh, less viscous, and it was intended to sprout throughout the spread throughout the treatment area to, to fill out fill in more voids. And those were represented by the um, black squares for primary MMG and the open squares for um, the secondary MMG treatments. Finally, the area is stabilized further by injecting a high mobility grout, uh, HMG, um, which was intended to move about the whole treatment area and fill whatever was left, um, pushing out the groundwater from the area and um, with the intent that now you have basically the old, old voids, collapse areas, anything that could receive grout, um, either thick grout, medium grout, or um, high mobility thin grout um, throughout the treatment area. This short video will give you an eye, a mind's eye view of what's going on in old mine workings. You can imagine this occurring eight, 80 feet below ground in a three to four foot tall mine workings and the grout is pumped through the borehole and sort of drops through the ceiling or the back of the mine. Um, and the grout continues to dump and slump and uh, it expands at its base with the hope that with, with the right viscosity, it stands up under its own weight to the point that it reaches the roof for a successful treatment, at which time pressures increase because the low mobility grouts kind of hit the top of the mine. And ideally you've got the volume in there to establish essentially the artificial pillar that you were shooting for there. So this is essentially a test of the, uh, the grout material and viscosity, um, doing little slump piles to see if it would indeed stand up under its own weight down in the mine workings and uh, give you a treatment uh, two and a half, three foot tall. So this is just to show you and give you an idea of what continuously reinforced concrete looks. Um, I, I just described it as a ridiculous amount of re-rod, uh, simply put, rebar simply put to um, to hold up and car doesn't crash down in it if, um, if a void opens up underneath. Uh, this is another photo by Larry, but I really liked it um, of the I-94 project. This is up in the North um, East quadrant and I think it's cool because you can see most of the test holes tagged here, rounded out with uh, a pile of coal cuttings, which kind of gives you an idea. Um, there was no indicated uh, mine workings here, and I think it would probably fall under that pillar area between the slope mine and the porter mine. Um, but I think that's kind of what you're looking for. Hey, you know, when you're doing these investigations, you're trying to find the voids I, ideally because they, you know you have to treat those areas, um, but gob and collapse areas too. Um, but then certainly there's, you're also getting what you need to know too if you tag a full coal seam. The process is pretty simple. Um, cement trucks dump premixed grout, either LMG, MMG, or HMG into a mud pump that pulsed the material down the holes while the volume and pressures were all observed to ensure they got the treatment they wanted in each hole. And of course, there's always issues. I was able to sit and be a fly on the wall in an interesting meeting with MDOT and their contractor or they're having trouble with the low mobility grout at first being too stiff, not getting the design treatment they want. Essentially, I think what was happening is it was standing too tall under its own weight and reaching the top of the ceiling. Um, and as soon as that grout made top, made, made contact with the top of the, um, the working, the, the mine back, um, pressures would shoot up and, and then they would, they would call the job, but they, based on volume, they were not getting the, the artificial pillar um, and treatment that they were shooting for. So like with anything, um, you have those interesting meetings, a little bit of finger pointing, like, well, you spec this out and, and whatever, but adjustments are made. And I think that's pretty common. 
in the end of the day, the I-94 coal project um, mitigation is viewed as a success. It ended, uh, it added $3.7 million, which seems like a lot for mine reclamation, um, but taken in the context of that entire I-94 corridor between Sargent and um, M60, uh, that whole project was 112 million. So really it added about 3.4% um, to the total cost. Obviously, if you did a smaller project, not a corridor project, like if you had just done the I-94 and Cooper Road interchange, then adding $3.7 million onto that single interchange project, the cost of that mine mitigation as a project percentage would have been much higher. A community like Jackson um, that's been so impacted by uh, economically in the late 1800s by coal mine now continues to pay, so to speak, um, for some of the prosperity, that prosperity in the form of higher project costs on infrastructure and occasionally homeowners are left um, in most cases dealing with the problems that may arise from the um, from mine subsidence. So I'm going to wrap this up without uh, getting too philosophical, um, but Michigan's coal mining industry was important for the time period it occurred. Um, and we should acknowledge that historic importance. And we should also recognize that some of the lasting impacts too. Um, and, and just to see if there's some lessons that could be learned from this. Um, basically, I, I kind of came away from this thinking about the following. Mining can create legacy issues and they can be costly. And at times they can last a really long time, maybe even for forever and forever's long time. Acknowledging that we need these minerals desperately in our society, uh, we need sustainable mining. And that means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, but to me, what that means in, in Michigan is to produce the most environmentally friendly minerals in the world and, and do it without creating lasting negative legacies. I think my takeaway here is to look a little further down the road. It's always easy to judge our predecessors for yesterday's legacy issues. And that drives me nuts because um, I really like to acknowledge that someone um, like me at that time period was very likely highly qualified at the time, acting with the best available information and made the best decision that they could with that information within their span of control and influence. Um, maybe that's not always true. There are bad actors, but I think by and large, they were charged with doing the same and, and they were doing what they felt was right. But knowing the fact that our predecessors had the best intentions, I think should give us the idea that we should just always look a little further ahead. And I, I like the Native American kind of center seven generations decision making model, but as regulators, we really don't, you know, that's not written into our, our statutes and um, we don't, we don't have that luxury. But I do think that we have some latitude to ask ourselves the what ifs. What if climate change impacts impact what I'm thinking about here? Is there a greater safety factor that I should be considering um, that could be employed? What if the model turns out to be incorrect? What's going to be the contingency? This is a great design that checks all the boxes, but what might I ought to think about operationally regarding the permit that addresses human error after construction? You can have a great design, um, but we know that a lot of things actually occur through human error. So what have we done to think about and address human error in those regards? Finally, we're having a lot of discussions within the Committee for Michigan's Mining Future, and we're thinking a lot about these things. Reclamation with uh, reuse of property in mind, uh, right from the beginning of the project and even acknowledging that reclamation and secondary um, land use should allow for even additional future mining if we consider what's uneconomical or today becomes tomorrow's new high grade or, or through human ingen ingenuity and innovation, um, we have new processing technology that um, improves the economics around that or I, I usually end non-regulatory presentations with this slide and this sentiment, and that is just please educate everybody about mineral and energy security. Understand who controls minerals and energy. How are they produced elsewhere? Allow space for innovation and improvement rather than um, pretty simple leave it in the ground movements. Learn and talk about how we're striving to um, create energy and extract minerals 
while doing it smarter and with the goal of not having le negative legacies for our drinking water, air, and soil, um, all while striving for carbon neutral and carbon negative solutions. I was I recently attended PDAC conference virtually this year, and um, I can tell you the ESG investment, uh, environment, social, and governance um, concepts, and ESG compliance. Um, took center stage. I really felt like it took center stage because um, companies' access to capital now is more reliant than ever on ESG compliance and less so on the investors just looking at the CapEx um, components and the, the strength of the, the, uh, the mineral play um, in, in deciding to invest in these projects. So these companies are, are basically dealing with this on both ends right now um to gain their capital um they have to to work within the bounds of esng compliance all at the same time mining companies are under pressure to um, decarbonize um, so indeed um, that is occurring um, even here in michigan we've got uh, companies in northern michigan that are producing carbon negative oil through uh, um, carbon injecting uh, CO2 underground to sweep the oil to the well bores. And then we also have mines like uh, Cleveland Cliffs is, is making strides to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, so just lots of talk even at PDAC about how you do that with changing over of mining equipments, electrifying, changing processes. Uh, so people are thinking a lot about that right now, trying to figure out how we continue to supply the, the minerals that we need for our society, um, but do it in a sustainable way. And with that, I thank you. Any questions for Adam? One of the things, as you know, Dave Westjohn uh, is now and has just completed mapping for quads in that area. And one of the things that he did and you had done for this highway as well, was try and research as much of the mine plans that were available. And because the Jackson area probably wasn't the predominant mining area, it kind of slowed down and you only had the premier mines operating. But I think what we found out is, is that you had, this goes probably from the 1920s until the 50s, 60s, that a lot of private people were finding out where the seam actually came to the surface and they started mining down and there were no records of that because A, they were using it for their own heat or B, they were selling it themselves rather than do it. And so we do have areas that are south of 94 that are right now starting to collapse selectively in the area because uh, they built over the top of it, not knowing, of course, that it had been mined out. And it's just one of the things that Jackson, sadly, is going to have to bear because there is no record of it. You can't do the kind of things that you did with the grouting, but houses are settling differentially in some of the areas just south of 94. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting when you think about a two and a half foot coal seam, you know, and the records reflect that some of these entire neighborhoods have probably settled three feet. But um, like with the homeowner that we worked with this last year, um, you get these collapse features and, um, you know, a washing down of, of glacial material down one of these holes into the mine workings, um, that, that could be a much longer thing. And it's certainly scary. In her case, it seems like the whole thing would drop as a plug, but boy, it's, it's a scary thought because it could easily bridge off even that glacial material bridge off to just the right part and somebody take a pretty, pretty good drop there. So you're right. It's a legacy issue, no doubt. Are you seeing those same slumps in the, the Saginaw area, um, John or, or Adam? I, I don't know. I'm not familiar. We don't get complaints. We, we, I guess the nine years, nine plus years that I've been back at oil, gas, and minerals division, I've not fielded complaints for slumps. I mean, a lot of times when we, we investigate sinkholes and slumps, it's um, more related to karst, um, most commonly, um, different areas. But um, I don't know, John, do you, do you have any knowledge? Those those mines up, up, up in Saginaw and Bay were generally deeper mines, deeper. so that's probably helps too. You got quite that's a lot right. more uh, right. overburden over those. I'm not aware of it, and maybe John Ash, because he's been working in that area a lot more than I have. But uh, the deeper the mine, of course, up there in Saginaw, but it was the shallow mine in the Jackson area that they were probably prospecting more going in on the seams from the surface. It's kind of a historical question. I noticed when you were talking about Jackson, 
he didn't mention uh, William Walker at all. It wasn't he one of the first guys around there started drilling coal mines in the 1850s or so? It, it, it could be. That name's not ringing a bell, but yeah, certainly there Walker was mine. a uh, Jackson. Named the, street, named the street after him. Did they? Yeah. yeah. Uh, right the Walker so. Coal Mine. So yeah, I mean, not, not surprised. Not surprised. It, it's funny for me. I'm a transplant. I married into Jackson. And so it's kind of interesting coming in and then um, as you live there a while, you start putting together names of places and streets and, and then you start digging through hundred year old news newspaper articles and you're like, Oh, wow. Well, okay. That's why that's named that park's named that. And that person, right. you know, that road's that road. When they were mining this out, they were in these really thin coal seams. How far underground did they eventually get? Most of the stuff in Jackson, I think you're anywhere from 40 to 60 feet, um, at least the references that I I had. And um, again, a lot of them were um, slope mines that just came in from outcrops and they they mined up dip or down dip. Um, but but some of them um, some of them were shaft mines or incline mines. The electric, the electric mine in Jackson might have been a steepest 100 feet out of the sandstone road. I have a question. I'm wondering if you guys in the U.S. ever have issues with locals, like if somebody wants to mine, like start or exploration even, just an exploration, do you guys have a lot of opposition? Because for example, in the Philippines, we've always had to explain it as much as we can. And even then I was in the research so we're just doing basic geological mapping and we always have to do like a short presentation to the locals so that they understand that we're not here to destroy things, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So just curious how it is like in Michigan. Yeah, it certainly does. I mean, as an agency, um, Oil, Gas, Minerals and Division ends up doing public hearings. We do public engagement. We um, engage indigenous Indian tribes on, on these things as as companies scope these projects, but uh, and that that social social license to operate kind of thing kind of filters into that ESNG concept. Um, so mining companies more and more, I would say, are are having to deal with that social license of operate to operate, and that's not something that like a state regulatory agency can take on for them. Um, you know, working with local people early and often, I think, is the prevailing business model um, much more than it was in the past. I think I think you've got to do that. Yeah, yes. I had a question because, as, as you mentioned, you know, I said I was up at Grand Ledge with our students on uh, Saturday, and there was a guy who came wandering by to see what we we're doing, and he was a little older, at least older than me. Um, and he said he could remember coming down in the 1970s to that area and watching them actually mining the coal. And I didn't realize that they were mining coal all the way until the 1970s. And he said they just were digging away at the slope. It wasn't underground mining or anything. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's close enough to the surface there that I think they just took it all. I mean, that's that's kind of visible from the pits there at the um, the uh, Lincoln Brick area. And then that Fitzgerald Park, that whole excavation there, I think maybe they were going for the vitreous clay and stuff underneath. But that I had that same thought Sunday when I was there, as I would imagine they just didn't let things go to waste if, if, if they didn't need to. So I would imagine they were firing something with the coal as they were making bricks. We're talking a lot about full value mining right now and thinking about um, other minerals that have traditionally been part of waste streams or things like that and recognizing that there might be abilities to capture and economic development. But it, it's kind of interesting when you look at some of these legacy things, the old timers were kind of all about full value too this orphan well we plugged in Muskegon last year is a 1870s vintage orphan well um, in the city of Muskegon from that lumber baron age. And, you know, you get digging in the records and they were using the brine, boiling off the brine for salt because salt was very valuable at that time. They were making, you know, they take the creosalt. So they, they were getting petroleum and brine out of that well. Um, so it was a lumber mill slash creosalt chemical factory slash salt factory. <laughs> Adam, in that same uh, kind of thought pattern, um, with the with the 
push now for rare earth elements. There seem to be a lot of rare earth elements in coals or associated with coals. Have there been any testing with our with our uh, coals to see if there are rare earth elements present and if it's even feasible to mine that? Well, I might have to defer to uh, John or Peter Voice if he's on the call. I, I haven't looked into that yet. I just know that the USGS is working on what well, you guys are working on that, Jenny. Yeah, we, we are. <laughs> we are. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know. Just getting yeah, my arms just, around that myself. I wasn't aware, and I just wondered if you had any info that we didn't have. I'm back to it. I, we have to look at the chemistry to see if there is any information available right now, and uh, just. For everybody's note right now, it's the Department of Energy that's really looking at the coal byproducts for critical minerals. And we're looking for the tie between either the upper or the lower bed of the, uh, the coal seam having the minerals in it. And so there is a potential that we could have some funding available through the Department of Energy to look at coal. But of course, we'd have to have the samples and hopefully we can get access to get some of the samples to do the analysis rather than having to do drilling right now. In other words, to give them enough indication that they would then support a project. Is there any attention to uh, the potential for coal bed methane involved with any of the coal beds in Michigan? That, that was one thing that was um, hinted at in some of the literature. I don't, I don't know exactly the reasons. Hal might even have information on that historically of um, whether it was tried or contemplated, but I know that we've done coal gasification, but that's quite a bit different, I would imagine, than like the traditional coal bed methane um, extraction in Wyoming, uh, you know, in, in West Virginia, that occurs elsewhere. At Dow, way back, I don't know, probably 30, 40 years ago, looked at uh, some in situ gasification. This is an experimental, I think they got some federal grant money for it or something, but it really never went beyond the initial experimental stage. I knew in my travels, there was a coal gasification project, I think, down in Je uh, Jonesville that ended up a remediation project. So I don't I don't know all the details, <laughs> but um, I don't know. I'm not waving any flags asking for um, coal bed methane to come back. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs>